Manhattan Project, Black Knight Brawl Incident, and Josie Carter. An interview with Josie Carter in 2011 revealed just one of Josie's most colorful adventures, which was to become a landmark event in Milwaukee LGBT history. The site of that event, which occurred eight years before the Stonewall Riots in New York City, has now been designated a landmark by the Milwaukee County Historical Society, as explained in an article in JS Online. That adventure is detailed by LGBT historian Mikhail Takik in his article in On Milwaukee. Highlights from that article. As the greatest generation continues to leave us, the actual course of these events has been slowly evaporating into hidden history. As a result, Many people today believe that LGBTQ history began with New York's Stonewall Riots of 1969. But eight years before Stonewall, Milwaukee was the scene of an early uprising unlike anything local police had ever seen before. On Saturday night, August 5, 1961, four troublemakers got more trouble than they bargained for at the Black Knight, 400 N. Plankinton Avenue, one of Milwaukee's most popular gay bars of the time. The Black Knight wasn't just a tavern that tolerated homosexuals. It was, from the start, a tavern that embraced and welcomed them. Wetham, a twice-married man with children, became well-known for creating a safe and generous space for his customers. All sexual and gender expressions were welcome a euro, something extremely rare to find in mid-century Milwaukee a euro, and customers were fiercely protective of their turf. That fierceness made itself known on Saturday, August 5, 1961. After partying at a Cane Place tavern, four 20-year-old servicemen decided to check out the Black Knight on a dare. Despite being asked several times, they refused to show any identification to the bouncer and wound up being forcibly removed. One of the servicemen would later claim that he was grabbed, punched and hit on the head with a bottle for no reason. But that's not exactly what happened. We didn't start anything but we sure as hell finished it, said Josie. Those guys only came down there to cause trouble. When, the bouncer, Josie's boyfriend, tried to kick them out, they all tried to fight him. And I thought, oh no, you're not going to hurt my husband. I went out there with a beer bottle in each hand, ready to knock some heads. This man turned on me. I thought, I can't let him put his hands on me. He was big, and he kept coming at me. I thought he would kill me. In that moment, I could fight off an army in a bathrobe. I let him have everything that was in that bottle. He went down. The servicemen fled the bar, took their injured friend to the county emergency hospital and went back to the Cane Place Tavern. They rounded up a dozen men and decided to go back downtown and clean up the black night. According to Josie, after the men left, Wally said, Okay, you guys have to get out of here, because God knows what is about to happen. But we did not run from a fight. We did not run from nothing, said Josie. And, wouldn't you know it, those big-ass mothers came back and just tore apart that bar, looking for little old me and my husband, because their buddy got beat up. Wally Wetham later reported that, this gang came in and started tearing the bar apart, and the bar fought back. Earlier that night, the servicemen had found a nearly empty bar and a four-to-one fight against the bouncer. This time, they found a packed bar of 75 patrons ready and willing to defend their turf by any means necessary. The battle didn't last long, but it was intense. One patron suffered extreme lacerations when he was thrown through a broken window. Another patron experienced a brain concussion when he was hit in the head with a barstool. He would remain in critical condition for weeks after the brawl. In the end, over $2,000 in losses were reported including the bar's entire bottled liquor inventory, an electric organ, a jukebox and all windows. One of the guys came at me and said, Okay you sick faggot, come on. I popped him right there, and the blood sprayed and he fell to the ground. I'll never forget that as long as I live. He started it, but I stopped it. I may be a faggot, but I'm the one who stopped it. And then the cops came down, and put them all in a paddy wagon, and took them to jail, said Josie Carter. They said, you have no business coming down here and harassing these people. The police were good to me back then. They took care of me and taught me how to stay out of trouble. I never had no problem with the police, as long as I didn't make problems. It's especially interesting that Josie, a self-described queen, who did not consider herself transgender despite living a full and proud female life, would make that statement. 
Laws prohibiting cross-dressing had been on the books since pioneer times, and even in the 1960s, police were empowered to apprehend, inspect and arrest any individual not wearing three pieces of biological gender-appropriate clothing. Today, we can't even imagine the bravery and boldness that was required to live a transgender life in mid-century Milwaukee. Oh, I was so proud of myself, but when I went back to the bar and grabbed the door handle a euro I realized my whole finger was pushed all the way backwards. I didn't even notice that during the fight. I just kept fighting. We all did. While Wetham and his patrons cleaned up the carnage, the four servicemen were charged with disorderly conduct. Unfortunately, Judge Christ T. Seraphim later dismissed their charges due to lack of evidence. And what about the person who threw the first bottle that started the brawl? Josie Carter recalls, I have never lived in fear. All someone can do is beat me up, but believe me, if I see them again, anywhere, I will walk up to them and tap them on the shoulder, said Josie. Remember me? I'll say, and they'll remember me. I promise you that. As anyone who had the privilege of meeting Josie will tell you, she was damn right. Webmaster's note. Josie was very shy and modest about her contributions. She shunned the spotlight and resisted the thought of celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Black Knight incident in 2011. While the transcript of the above interview spells the location as the Black Knight, the bar where the incident occurred was actually spelled the Black Knight. Many of Milwaukee's earliest gay rights activists spoke about how the Black Knight brawl inspired them. It was a call to arms for many community leaders, including Ildon Murray and Alan Hess, founders of Gay People's Union. It was also the first time they saw a Milwaukee gay bar mentioned in the newspaper. Like many men of their generation, they sought out news stories mentioning gay people and places throughout their childhoods, only to find negative indictments of gay people as criminals, perverts, or sexual deviates. For the gay rights generation, the Black Knight offered a glimmer of hope and a spark of revolution. View the Ildon Murray papers online at UWM by clicking here. In 2021, the curator of the Wisconsin LGBTQ History Project, Mikhail Takik, had the idea of commemorating the brawl by holding a press conference on the 60th anniversary of the event. The anniversary was the opportunity for the political leaders of the time to recognize what the brawl had meant to Wisconsin's early LGBTQ movement, and was recognized with proclamations and resolutions from the governor, mayor, and county executive. As a result of applications filed in June 2021, in November 2022 the site of the Black Knight Bar, demolished some 50 years prior, was recognized by the Milwaukee County Landmarks Committee with an historic landmark designation. Work continues to get state landmark designation, and markers of these designations posted on site. View the Black Knight 60th Anniversary webpage. View the Black Knight Tavern webpage. View the Josie Carter biography page. View the Library of Congress recognition of Milwaukee's Black Knight Uprising on their website. View article in Milwaukee Magazine, June 2022. View History.com article on LGBTQ uprisings prior to Stonewall. With Josie Carter, 1966. Photo courtesy of Josie Carter. Milwaukee Sentinel, August 7, 1961.
I feel is, is the saddest and the ugliest part of being a homosexual. Uh, when you have your first bad love experience, for instance, and you can't go to your brother or your sister and say, I'm hurting. At first, I was very guilty. And then I realized that all the things that are taught you not only by society, but by psychiatrists, just to fit you in a mold. And I've just rejected the mold, and when I rejected the mold, I was happier. These are mostly independent organizations all across the country. There's, there's somewhere between 60 and 75 independent groups across the United States, maybe more now, because they keep growing up overnight. And uh, this is a unified effort on the part of uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 organizations on the East Coast. There are differences primarily of approach and of tactics. Certain groups, for example, uh, tend to emphasize very militant confrontation tactics. Other groups will emphasize a more educational approach, going out uh, into areas where there are what you might call people who, uh, middle America people who don't know very much about homosexuality. And uh, other groups will emphasize different things. Some groups, most groups, in fact, provide some kind of social services for our own people, help for people in need. But this is a minor part of the effort. The major effort today is to change the social institutions that make life difficult for us. is the worst incident that has ever happened to you since you've been gay, as far as being gay? Uh, I guess my parents, you know, them finding out was the worst. What is the American church? It's a sacramental Catholic church devoted to the needs of gay people, the homophile community. as a human being and as a woman. Right. Together, right? Yeah. On an equal basis. I'm for women's liberation too. I'm active in both movements. And uh, the two are definitely combined and in the two communities that come together and find out their common denominators, which are very strong because most of the beliefs of heterosexual women and women's liberation and homosexual women are the same. Nothing else but good for the population explosion. Can you tell me what you feel about the homophile movement? I think it's great. I think it's really dynamite. And I think the only way to achieve it is through force and marches like this. And I think the only way to achieve it is through force and marches like this.
Can you tell me what you thought about Charlie Brown, the Sodom and Gomorrah guy carrying the American flag? He's a closet queen, and you can find him in Howard Johnson any night. And what color underwear does he wear? Pink. Thank you. Is your dog gay? Yes. <laughs> I'm for bisexuals myself. <laughs> Do you recommend it? Absolutely. Are That's you? where I think it's at. Think about gay people in the great, man. Great. Do your right. thing, man. That's all right. What about where you're stationed? Fort Dix. Fort Dix. It's definitely a communist front march. It's to it's separate. It's to separate the people. They've done it with the black movement. They've done it with the Italian movement. They've done it with the Jewish movement. Now they're doing it with the uh, the gay movement, so to speak. This is what Hitler did in Germany. You want to know, baby? He used all the frustrated homosexuals as the Gestapo. Listen, you all You are not, since you are not homosexual, obviously, why are you in... Well, I'm taking it for granted, sir. Why are you in the parade today? What is your motivation? Well, I knew some people here, and they convinced me to go. <laughs> Do you think that homosexuality should be legalized completely a la Illinois? Definitely, definitely. Would you ever marry a girl who had been a homosexual? Uh, yeah. I think it would be more interesting. added stress of being a homosexual in a heterosexual society causes a lot of torment in the homosexual relationships of women? Yes, it does. A lot of women seem to think that if they're with women because they've rejected men in that, in that sense, but if they come to realize they're with women because they want to be and have rejected a role, then they wouldn't be guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any idea how long they have to go? As far as this thing today is concerned, I mean, it's all right to say what you feel, as long as you keep it at an intellectual level. I mean, all of this orgy stuff and all that is, I think it's kind of ridiculous, you know? Tell you, if straight people can do it. As long as you keep it at an intellectual level. I mean, all of this orgy stuff and all that is, I think it's kind of ridiculous, you know? Tell you, if straight people can do it, why can't we? No, really, if straight people can do all this carrying on and holding hands and kids in the park, why can't we do it? All right. They I'm ain't no better than I am. I'm not talking about <laughs> kissing and holding hands in the park. But I mean, like, He's talking I, about uh, liberalization. No, I'm talking about some some guy dropping his pants. All right. I mean, stop. So, Mary, I've seen people fuck in the park, <laughs> women and men. All right, but that doesn't mean we have to do it. It gives but us a bad that we name. Should, we should have the right to do it. If they can do it, we should be able to do it if we want to. If we want to get a bad name for ourselves. You're right. Name. It's a kissing contest song. What does this mean? Um, it means uh, the heterosexual uh, kissing record, I believe, is nine hours, and we're going to attempt to break the record by having uh, uh, a homosexual couple beat the time. Oh, go do it, Myra! Recommend! <laughs> <laughs> Myra, say something to the press. Tell me how you feel about being here today. I feel it's beautiful. It's fantastic. How many years have you been a homosexual? 
I was born homosexual is beautiful. Has the new movement given you an added pride or added incentive? Yes. I was sorry not to see, though, that there was uh, not some politician or something here with us today. Uh, I think Lindsay should have made it a point to be here today, as well as possibly some of the gay uh, movement organizers themselves. At least they might have been here, but they didn't speak out to us, and they should have. Also, I think there should have been a United States flag at the beginning of the parade, which I didn't see. But I think the people were very well behaved, very well mannered, and I think the police respected us. And I think it was the showing that we'll really make it. Because if two homosexuals can live together and thrive and to be constructive rather than destructive to each other and themselves, without legal bonds, without children, without the sanction of the great society, then uh, they can demonstrate to heterosexuals they need not be so concerned with their property and their marriage and divorce laws. And you think that you're happier now that you've realized exactly where your feelings lie? Indeed, I'm just sorry that it took so long. I'm sorry that I spent so many years in the closet. Somebody dropped an eyelash. <laughs> I mean, it really finally comes down to finding one other person to love and be loved by, and you serve each other's needs. University. Stonewall Then and Now. By Colleen Walsh. Harvard scholars reflect on the history and legacy of the milestone gay rights demonstrations triggered by a police raid at a dive bar in Manhattan. Michael Bronsky wasn't at Stonewall and doesn't mind admitting it. Unlike many members of the gay and lesbian community of a certain age who, he says, insist they were. The joke is that if everyone who claims they took part in the famous 1969 uprising in Lower Manhattan that catalyzed America's gay rights movement actually had been there, the crowd, Bronsky says with a laugh, would have filled Yankee Stadium. In truth, the crowd that day numbered about 200, at least at first. And they weren't protesters but mostly patrons of the Stonewall Inn, a popular Greenwich Village gay bar. The trouble started when the police arrived in the wee hours of June 28 to raid the mafia-run tavern on a trumped-up liquor license charge. Officers started pushing customers and workers into police vehicles. But instead of dispersing as they had during past routine raids, those who hadn't been grabbed began cheering those who had. The crowd of onlookers swelled as tourists and neighborhood residents stopped to investigate. Then, according to multiple accounts, a lesbian who was fighting attempts to haul her into a squad car cried out, Why don't you guys do something? The air grew thick with chants, along with bottles and bricks. The officers barricaded themselves in the bar and radioed for backup as a riot flared. More violent demonstrations shook the neighborhood in the following days. Today, Bronsky, a Harvard professor of the practice in media and activism in studies of women, gender, and sexuality, understands why so many claim to have been present at such a pivotal moment in the history of the gay rights movement. It really is like the shot heard around the world, or the hairpin drop heard around the world, he said, a cheeky parody coined in Stonewall's aftermath of the stanza from Concord Hymn. There had been previous riots in the U.S. involving gays and lesbians fed up with routine harassment, but Stonewall, erupting when it did amid protests over the Vietnam War and civil rights and gender equality, marked a decisive break from the more passive sexual orientation politics of the day, said Bronsky, who has written extensively on LGBTQ culture and history. It was really like direct action. It was like the radical feminists invading the Miss America contest or the Black Panthers standing in front of Oakland City Hall with rifles, he said, and it ran completely counter to the approach of groups such as the Mattachine Society, one of the nation's earliest gay rights organizations, that preferred to press for change through legal and political channels. Not long after the Stonewall raid, a message appeared on the boarded-up window of the bar, pleading for the return of peaceful and quiet conduct on the streets of the village. It was signed, Mattachine. What's so amazing is that they would never have thought of doing anything public like that before, said Bronsky. So literally overnight, Mattachine is forced into making a public announcement with essentially graffiti. For Bronsky, Stonewall represented a shocking change of consciousness for the world. 
and in its wake rose the Gay Liberation Front, a more radical version of the Mattachine Society unafraid to use confrontation to push reform. But there were other organizations helping drive change. Harvard's Evelyn Hammonds, chair of the Department of the History of Science, Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science, and Professor of African and African American Studies, said that in the years after Stonewall the story of greater visibility for gay people in America was often seen through the lens of gay men. That perspective, she said, overlooks a key connection. At the time of what we now call the Stonewall Rebellion, what was also happening was the second wave of the women's movement. And while there were lots of tensions in some women's organizations between lesbians and straight women, there was also a great deal of unity and people were coming together around a shared desire for greater equality for women and gay people, said Hammonds. A look at the history. Though their methods may not have been as radical, early so-called homophile organizations, including the Mattachine Society, Janus Society, and Daughters of Bilitis, set the stage for what followed, says Timothy Patrick McCarthy, a lecturer in public policy and core faculty at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard Kennedy School. The foundation for the movement that emerges in fuller form in the wake of Stonewall was laid in the decades before in public and private battles, in different organizations, and through the work of many people, said McCarthy, whose book, Stonewall's Children, Living Queer History in an Age of Liberation, Loss, and Love, will be published by the New Press next year. Many such groups materialized during World War II in the post-war era in response to the military's anti-homosexual policies and the paranoid frenzy of the Red Scare. McCarthy points to the Lavender Scare, a fear campaign that paralleled Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy's investigations into what he considered widespread subversive forces at work in the federal government in the 1950s. While simultaneously trying to expose suspected communists, the Wisconsin senator also targeted suspected homosexuals arguing that deviant sexual behavior, like deviant political ideology, were things that made people more vulnerable to blackmailing, said the Harvard scholar, who recently edited a special issue of The Nation examining Stonewall's legacy. McCarthy's tactics initially garnered widespread support. President Dwight D. Eisenhower issued an executive order in 1953 banning homosexuals from working for the federal government, citing security risk. Thousands lost their jobs because of their actual or perceived sexual orientation. Among them was the man many have called the father of the gay rights movement, Frank Kameny, who received his master's and doctorate degrees in astronomy from Harvard in 1949 and 1956, respectively. After the Army Map Service fired him as an astronomer in 1957, Kameny unsuccessfully sued the federal government and later devoted his life to fighting for gay rights. Among his many achievements, Kameny, who died at the age of 86 in 2011, was known for founding the Mattachine Society of Washington, D.C., picketing the White House, contesting the American Psychiatric Association's categorization of homosexuality as a mental defect, and coining the term, gay is good. Stonewall's legacy. Hammonds wasn't at Stonewall either, but the image looms large in her mind thanks in part to the actions of those eager to keep its spirit alive. During the Eastern Regional Conference of Homophile Organizations in 1969, a young activist called for nationwide demonstrations each June in honor of Stonewall. New York's first Pride Parade, named the Christopher Street Liberation Day, was held in June of 1970, just a year after the riots. The march began on Christopher Street where the bar, now a historic landmark, was located, and it ended in Central Park. The event attracted thousands and signaled another important milestone. In the years that followed more cities and towns organized parades in support of gay rights. The marches were among the first highly visible public events for people to express their gay sexuality and for allies to have an opportunity to support the gay people in their lives, said Hammonds, who was a graduate student in Boston in 1976 when she attended the city's pride parade and first heard of Stonewall. The marches also became vehicles for political expression as well which you could see by the signs that people held up, which made the marches political moments as well as scenes of gay pride. Even local politicians recognized this and slowly, over time, more politicians would join the marches. One march in Washington, D.C., in the fall of 1987 left another lasting impact on Hammonds. The event coincided with the first showing of the AIDS memorial quilt, 
a massive patchwork blanket adorned with the names of those who had died. The colorful fabric covered an area on the National Mall larger than a football field and contained 1,920 panels that captured the beautiful range and diversity of the gay experience with a kind of poignancy and sadness, but also affirmation of gay life that I had never seen before, said Hammonds. The epidemic raised the visibility of the gay community further as more and more people were forced to come out to family and friends, she said. When young men began to get sick, a lot of them had to return to the places where they grew up, because some didn't have anybody to take care of them in the cities where many gay people had congregated, said Hammonds. They returned to the small towns, or smaller cities in places where many people in their lives didn't know that they were gay, of course. Not everyone was welcomed home with open arms. But ironically one of the consequences of the epidemic was that more Americans became aware of gay people in their communities. Hammond said she has been shocked at the rapid pace of change she has witnessed over the last 40 years. From attending her first gay pride parade to watching the faces of pride marchers get younger and increasingly diverse to getting married and starting a family. We got married the first night you could, said Hammonds, who arrived at Cambridge City Hall on May 17, 2004, with her partner just after midnight so they could be among the first in the country to be granted a same-sex marriage license. Cambridge was the first municipality in the country to issue the licenses. It was the most amazing thing to come out of the front door of City Hall and see Massachusetts Avenue just filled with people singing and yelling with joy that gay marriage was now legal. Still, Hammond sees difficult times ahead and anticipates very serious attempts at retrenchment. There appears to be a growing backlash from people who feel that expanding gay rights and rights for transgender people means that heterosexuals have lost something they can never regain. But fortunately the younger generation sees the world differently now. Many have grown up in a world where there is more equality, more acceptance of sexual and gender difference, and they value it, and they are comfortable with it. So those of us who are older have to do whatever we can to support them in holding on to those rights we marched for a long time ago and that we continue to fight for. McCarthy's concern about the future echoes the struggle the Mattachine Society and the Gay Liberation Front grappled with years ago. He wonders how best to work within the system while still being considered radical. Much of what we have seen in policy in the modern era is an impulse to assimilation. We can get married, serve in military, be just like you. There's been a real push to become part of these mainstream institutions, part of the system of laws and politics in the country. But the most important questions are these. Who does this leave out and what kinds of bargains have to be made to prove that we are just like straight people? With his students, he says he has arrived at a fairly broad consensus that we need a both and politics. We need a politics that is at once pragmatic and radical. We need different kinds of change agents, working in different locations with different tactics, to achieve these larger aspirations. Bronsky is both hopeful and worried about the transgender rights movement that he likens to Stonewall in terms of the excitement and change it has helped inspire. There is this enormous cultural change around the intersections of gender and sexuality and gender and identity and gender and, to a large degree, class and economics and money, said Bronsky. But it's also getting the most blowback from the Trump administration. Bronsky said he could envision an effort by conservative groups to repeal the 2015 U.S. Supreme Court decision that ruled the Constitution protects same-sex marriage, but added that the potential outcome of such an attempt is less clear. You do actually have hundreds of thousands of people probably who are now married. So if you repealed the law do you repeal their marriage? Do you grandfather them in? It gets complicated. Like Hammonds and McCarthy, Bronsky, whose latest book is titled, a queer history of the United States for young people, also sees hope in the nation's youth. Today my gay students are incredible, and they have been for 10 years. They are more progressive and radical and on the edge than most people I know, he said, and that's totally change. NN. 50 years ago, pride was born. This is what it looked like. When the Stonewall Uprising began 50 years ago, No one knew it would become such a pivotal moment in the gay rights movement. But Fred W. McDarrah was there from the beginning. As far as we know, he was the only professional photographer on the scene at that point, said Sarah Seidman, the Puffin Foundation curator of social activism at the Museum of the City of New York. I think there are a few other photographs floating around, but his are definitely the most well-known. 
No one covered the riots, and their aftermath, like McDara, who was the staff photographer at the Village Voice, an alternative newspaper just a few doors down from the Stonewall Inn. The Stonewall riots started in the early morning hours of June 28, 1969, when patrons of the Stonewall Inn fought back against a police raid. At the time, raids were a popular occurrence at gay bars. Jill Johnston, author of Lesbian Nation, attends one of the early pride parades in New York in June 1971. Soon after the riots broke out, McDara was there to document the LGBTQ community as it stood up to say enough was enough. Fred saw it all and recorded it all. The young queer people who were tired of being told that their way of being was obscene, that the families they'd made were twisted, all those folks who had been told year after year and all their lives that they were wrong. Hilton Owls wrote in a new foreword for McDara's book, Pride, Photographs After Stonewall. McDara died in 2007 after working at the Village Voice for more than 50 years. He made his name by chronicling the Beat Generation and the counterculture movement in New York City. But his extensive work on the Pride movement lives on, through his book, recently updated for Stonewall's 50th anniversary, and an exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York. A look inside the Stonewall Inn after the riots. The Pride exhibit features McDara's images from the uprising as well as the marches it inspired in the weeks and years that followed. We wanted to get at the serious and sometimes somber part of it as well as the fun and celebratory part of it, Seidman said. McDara's photos are now a significant part of LGBTQ history in the United States. His work was featured by the White House when the Stonewall Inn was designated as a national monument in 2016. The windows of the Stonewall Inn were boarded up with plywood and painted black immediately after the riots. The Mattachine Society, one of the earliest gay rights organizations, joined irate customers in covering the windows with graffiti. The first Stonewall anniversary march was held on June 28, 1970. The annual march continues to this day. A pride marcher in 1971. We tried to capture, in, McDara's, work, as diverse a range of New Yorkers as possible, said Sarah Seidman, the Puffin Foundation Curator of Social Activism at the Museum of the City of New York. People take part in one of New York City's first pride marches in 1973. People march in New York in 1973. In the aftermath of Stonewall, other cities began to hold marches, too, including Chicago, Los Angeles and San Francisco. Activist Marsha P. Johnson, Wright, was a popular figure in New York's downtown art scene who modeled for Andy Warhol. She is remembered as one of the most significant activists for transgender rights, although the term, transgender, wasn't commonly used during her lifetime. People kiss during the 1970 march. Seidman said McDara's photos show, an evolution, as more and more people came out of the shadows to openly celebrate their identity in the streets. Parents march with their children in 1973. A man holds a sign during the 1971 march. Mama Jean Devente, left, and a friend attach a bouquet at the Stonewall doorway to commemorate the fifth anniversary of the riots. Marsha P. Johnson, a black transgender woman, was a central figure in the gay liberation movement. By Christina Maxoris. 
Marsha P. Johnson stood at the center of New York City's gay liberation movement for nearly 25 years. But LGBTQ rights weren't her only cause. She was on the front lines of protests against oppressive policing. She helped found one of the country's first safe spaces for transgender and homeless youth. And she advocated tirelessly on behalf of sex workers, prisoners and people with HIV, AIDS. All while draped in dashing outfits and flower headpieces and armed. People who knew her say, with a vibrant smile. The, nobody, from Nowheresville, as she described herself in a 1992 interview, moved to New York City from her hometown of Elizabeth, New Jersey, with nothing but $15 in her pocket. That's when she adopted the name Marsha P. Johnson. The P, she told people, stood for, pay it no mind. Marsha would talk to me all the time and tell me, don't let anybody tell you what to do. Be who you want to be, her nephew, Al Michaels, recalled. Johnson was a drag performer and a sex worker. She was often homeless and lived with mental illness. Her body was found in the Hudson River in 1992, and the circumstances of her death remain unclear. New York police ruled the death a suicide and didn't investigate. She is remembered as one of the most significant activists for transgender rights, although the term, transgender, wasn't commonly used during her lifetime. Johnson identified as a transvestite, gay and a drag queen, and used she, her pronouns. She was the ultimate survivor, said L. Hearns, a human rights activist who created an institute bearing Johnson's name. I don't think Marsha has left anything behind besides the permission for us all to be free. We had enough police harassment. Johnson played a key role in the uprising that began on June 28, 1969 at the Stonewall Inn in New York's Greenwich Village after police raided the gay bar and patrons fought back. Protests followed over the next six days. We were, throwing over cars and and screaming in the middle of the street cause we were so upset cause they closed that place. Johnson told historian Eric Marcus in a 1989 interview that's now been compiled into an episode for the, Making Gay History, podcast. We were just saying, no more police brutality, and, we had enough of police harassment in the village and other places. The first anniversary of the protests prompted the first gay pride parade in 1970. Johnson, alongside her good friend Sylvia Rivera, emerged from the clashes as leaders in the nascent gay liberation movement. They helped found the Group Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, STAR, which offered housing to homeless and transgender youth. The pioneering activists were concerned about the dangers faced by transgender people who were often forced into prostitution to support themselves, according to the New York Public Library. They created the first LGBT youth shelter in North America and the first organization in the United States led by trans women of color, according to the Global Network of Sex Work Projects. Johnson was also an AIDS activist associated with the group ACT up until her death. Battling ongoing violence. Last month, the city of New York announced it will build a monument to honor Johnson and Rivera for their role in the Stonewall Uprising and advocacy for LGBTQ, homeless and HIV-positive youth, particularly young people of color who were marginalized by broader LGBTQ rights efforts. It will be the first permanent, public artwork recognizing transgender women in the world, the city said. Transgender and non-binary communities are reeling from violent and discriminatory attacks across the country, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio said. Here in New York City, we are sending a clear message. We see you for who you are, we celebrate you, and we will protect you. At least 10 transgender people have been violently killed in 2019, and at least 26 were killed in 2018, according to the Human Rights Campaign. Most were black transgender women, the organization said. The newly launched Masha P. Johnson Institute will continue some of the work Johnson started, advocating for and organizing on behalf of the transgender community, said Hearns, the Institute's founder and executive director. Hearns said she chose Johnson's name to highlight the intersectionality of her experience as a black transgender woman. So many of us in the world are aware of her name and are aware of the image of what she looked like but are not necessarily aware of her work and how she experienced life as a black woman and just as a black person who had defined what gender meant, she told CNN. Future generations will look to Johnson as a reference for their own identity, for their own development, 
for their own understanding of what it means to have autonomy in oneself, Hearn said. She liberated the neighborhood. Michael says he'll remember Johnson as a beacon of hope for everyone around her, someone who brought both friends and strangers home for the holidays. We'd open the door and there'd be 20 to 25 people, Michael said. People, Johnson had, never seen and just picked up on the streets. Johnson, always told us, treat other people with respect, be kind to people. In turn, he said, whenever Johnson returned to her old neighborhood she received a warm welcome. Everybody would be on the porch saying, hey Marsha, Michael said. Even older people, he says, who didn't initially accept Johnson's bold brand of activism eventually came around. She turned the neighborhood, he says. She actually liberated the neighborhood. If she were here today, he says, she'd still be pushing. I think the most important message from her was, don't relax, the fight isn't over, he said. We want 100% of our rights that everybody else gets and until we get that, the fight continues. Stonewall. Why now is the time to take pride in supporting LGBTQ plus rights? Research tells us that in 2022, the United Kingdom is a country that is proud to be inclusive. One where its people are increasingly embracing their LGBTQ plus neighbors, colleagues, family and friends. However, with intolerant, minority viewpoints being presented as fact in our media and in our politics, it's never been more important to show up to protect our rights. As we look back on 50 years of pride in the UK, we can reflect on how LGBTQ plus acceptance has seen one of the fastest and most dramatic changes in public attitude in post-war Britain. According to the British Social Attitudes Survey in 1987, at the height of the AIDS epidemic and the dawn of Section 28, three-quarters of the public said they felt that a same-sex relationship was either, always, or, mostly, wrong. These attitudes were often fueled by sensationalist, homophobic reporting in our press. 35 years on, the world has changed, even if the headlines haven't. Our research shows that today, the UK public is significantly more likely to take pride in supporting the LGBTQ plus community than it is to find them wrong. One in three people reported they actively respect us, and one in five declared admiration. Less than one in 20 reported feelings of envy, resentment, or fear. This report adds further color to the beautiful picture being painted by other pieces of research. YouGov polling shows more than 7 in 10 Brits would support someone close to them who came out as LGBTQ+, and greater numbers of people now feel comfortable being out as their true selves. Despite this, the hard-won rights of LGBTQ plus people are under threat. In the digital age of misinformation, we're facing new, often underhanded, challenges that threaten to weaken the foundations on which we're building a safer future for all. Through attacks in our politics, online, and in our media, who continue to promote what are now demonstrably minority viewpoints uncontested, the LGBTQ plus community finds itself under a near-constant deluge. And the real harm is already being felt. This year, the UK government reversed its promise to implement a trans-inclusive ban on conversion practices, acting against international medical and human rights consensus, and instead acting on rhetoric. The result is a ban that, in its current guise, will ultimately end up protecting no one from abuse. Additionally, the UK government's own research has shown that reported LGBTQ plus hate crime has grown at double the rate of other forms of hate crime over the past two years. And with four in five anti-LGBT hate crimes going unreported, these figures are likely only the tip of the iceberg. Words have an impact, and the debates on LGBTQ inclusive education and trans equality in the media, online, and in the street are creating an environment where an LGBTQ phobic minority feel emboldened to make us less safe. And the world is noticing. The Council of Europe approved a report by the Parliamentary Assembly which condemns extensive and often virulent attacks on the rights of LGBTI people for several years in the UK. And our country has dropped down ILGA Europe's annual ranking of LGBTQ plus rights across Europe for the third year running, plummeting from 1 to 14 since 2015. None of this is the will of the UK public. That's why it's now more important than ever that we, as a majority movement of people who support LGBTQ plus equality, make our voices heard. We've fought and won before, and we can do it again. 
Over the past 50 years, since the first Pride in London marched against police pushback, we've witnessed a host of dramatic changes that have improved countless LGBTQ plus lives. We've been fearless in our demand for progress in the face of ongoing anti-LGBTQ plus sentiment. But our work is never done. Now is the time to act. Together. As long as LGBTQ phobia threatens our ability to thrive as our true selves, we must all stand up for LGBTQ plus rights and resist attempts to drive us back into hiding. We're stronger together, but we must not stand passively by as a silent majority. So, let's speak up and act now to show the world, and our leaders, that we are a country that is proud to be inclusive. Take the first step now. Sign the pledge below and add your voice to our collective call for real, positive change. Cyclopedia Britannica. Gay Rights Movement. By Michael Levy. Read a brief summary of this topic. Gay Rights Movement, also called Gay Liberation Movement, civil rights movement that advocates equal rights for LGBTQ persons, i.e., for lesbians, gays, homosexual males, bisexuals, transgender persons, and queer persons, seeks to eliminate sodomy laws, and calls for an end to discrimination against LGBTQ persons in employment, credit, housing, public accommodations, and other areas of life. Although the term gay is commonly used in reference to homosexual males, it is also used more generally to refer to homosexual males together with some or all other orientations within the LGBTQ community. This article will use the term in the latter sense. Gay rights prior to the 20th century. Religious admonitions against sexual relations between individuals of the same sex, particularly men, long stigmatized such behavior. But most legal codes in Europe were silent on the subject of homosexuality and bisexuality. The judicial systems of many predominantly Muslim countries invoked Islamic law, Sharia, in a wide range of contexts and many sexual or quasi-sexual acts, including same-sex intimacy, were criminalized in those countries and made subject to severe penalties, including execution. Beginning in the 16th century, lawmakers in England began to categorize sexual relations between males as criminal rather than simply immoral. In the 1530s, during the reign of Henry VIII, England passed the Buggery Act, which made sexual relations between men a criminal offense punishable by death. In England and Great Britain, sodomy remained a capital offense punishable by hanging until 1861. Two decades later, in 1885, Parliament passed an amendment, sponsored by Henry Dupre Laboucher, that created the offense of gross indecency for same-sex male sexual relations, enabling any form of sexual behavior between men to be prosecuted, lesbian sexual relations, because they were unimaginable to male legislators, were not subject to the law. Likewise, in Germany in the early 1870s, when the country was integrating the civil codes of various disparate kingdoms, the final German penal code included paragraph 175, which criminalized same-sex male relations and made them subject to penalties including imprisonment and loss of civil rights. The Beginning of the Gay Rights Movement Before the end of the 19th century there were scarcely any movements for gay rights. Indeed, in his poem, Two Loves, 1894, Lord Alfred, Bosey, Douglas, Oscar Wilde's lover, declared, I, homosexuality, am the love that dare not speak its name. Homosexual and bisexual men and women were given voice in 1897 with the founding of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, Wissenschaftlich Humanitaires Committee, WHK, in Berlin. Their first activity was a petition to call for the repeal of paragraph 175 of the Imperial Penal Code, submitted 1898, 1922, and 1925. The committee published emancipation literature, sponsored rallies, and campaigned for legal reform throughout Germany as well as in the Netherlands and Austria, and by 1922 it had developed some 25 local chapters. One of the founders of WHK was Magnus Hirschfeld, who in 1919 opened the Institute for Sexual Science, Institute für Sexualwissenschaft which anticipated by decades other scientific centers, such as the Kinsey Institute for Research in Sex, Gender, and Reproduction, in the United States, that specialized in sex research. He also helped sponsor the World League of Sexual Reform, which was established in 1928 at a conference in Copenhagen. 
Despite paragraph 175 and the failure of the WHK to win its repeal, homosexual and bisexual men and women experienced a certain amount of freedom in Germany, particularly during the Weimar period, between the end of World War I and the Nazi seizure of power. In many larger German cities, gay nightlife became tolerated, and the number of gay publications increased. Indeed, according to some historians, the number of gay bars and periodicals in Berlin in the 1920s exceeded that in New York City six decades later. Adolf Hitler's seizure of power ended this relatively liberal period. He ordered the reinvigorated enforcement of paragraph 175, and on May 6, 1933, German student athletes raided and ransacked Hirschfeld's archives and burned the Institute's materials in a public square. Outside Germany, other organizations were also created. For example, in 1914, the British Society for the Study of Sex Psychology was founded by Edward Carpenter and Havelock Ellis for both promotional and educational purposes. And in the United States in 1924, Henry Gerber, an immigrant from Germany, founded the Society for Human Rights, which was chartered by the state of Illinois. Despite the formation of such groups, political activity by homosexuals and bisexuals was generally not very visible. Indeed, Gays were often harassed by the police wherever they congregated. World War II and its aftermath began to change that. The war brought many young people to cities and brought visibility to the gay community. In the United States this greater visibility brought some backlash, particularly from the government and the police. The government often fired gay civil servants, the military attempted to purge its ranks of gay soldiers, a policy enacted during World War II and police vice squads frequently raided gay bars and arrested their patrons. However, there was also greater political activity among gays, aimed in large measure at decriminalizing sodomy. The gay rights movement since the mid-20th century Beginning in the mid-20th century, an increasing number of gay organizations were formed. The Kultur en Anspanning Centrum, Culture and Recreation Center, or COC, was founded in 1946 in Amsterdam. In the United States the first major male organization, founded in 1950-51 by Harry Hay in Los Angeles, was the Mattachine Society, its name reputedly derived from a medieval French society of masked players, the Société Mattachine, to represent the public, masking, of homosexuality, while the Daughters of Bilitis, named after the sapphic love poems of Pierre Laouis, Chansons de Bilitis, founded in 1955 by Phyllis Leone and Del Martin in San Francisco, was a leading group for women. In addition, the United States saw the publication of a national gay periodical, one, which in 1958 won a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that enabled it to be mailed through the U.S. Postal Service. In Britain in 1957 a commission chaired by Sir John Wolfenden issued a groundbreaking report, see Wolfenden Report, recommending that private homosexual liaisons between consenting adults be removed from the domain of criminal law. A decade later the recommendation was implemented by Parliament in the Sexual Offenses Act. The gay rights movement was beginning to win victories for legal reform, particularly in Western Europe, but perhaps the single defining event of gay activism occurred in the United States. In the early morning hours of June 28, 1969, the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar in New York City's Greenwich Village, was raided by the police. Nearly 400 people joined a riot that lasted 45 minutes and resumed on succeeding nights. Stonewall came to be commemorated annually in June with gay pride celebrations, not only in U.S. cities but also in several other countries. Gay pride is also held at other times of the year in some countries. In the 1970s and 80s, gay political organizations proliferated, particularly in the United States and Europe, and spread to other parts of the globe, though their relative size, strength, and success, and toleration by authorities, varied significantly. Groups such as the Human Rights Campaign, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, in the United States and Stonewall and Outrage, in the United Kingdom, and several dozen similar organizations in continental Europe and elsewhere, began agitating for legal and social reforms. In addition, the Transnational International Lesbian and Gay Association was founded in Coventry, England, in 1978. Now headquartered in Geneva and renamed the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans and Intersex Association, ILGA World, 
It plays a significant role in coordinating international efforts to promote human rights and fight discrimination against LGBTQ and intersex persons. In the United States, gay activists won support from the Democratic Party in 1980, when the party added to its platform non-discrimination clause a plank including sexual orientation. This support, along with campaigns by gay activists urging gay men and women to come out of the closet, indeed, in the late 1980s, National Coming Out Day was established, and it is now celebrated on October 11th in most countries, encouraged gay men and women to enter the political arena as candidates. The first openly gay government officials in the United States were Jerry DeGreek and Nancy Weschler in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Both DeGreek and Weschler were elected in 1972 and came out while serving on the city council. In 1974 Weschler was replaced on the council by Kathy Kazachenko, who, having run openly as a lesbian, thus became the first openly gay person to win office after coming out. In 1977 gay rights activist Harvey Milk was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. He was assassinated the following year. In 1983 Jerry Studs, a sitting U.S. representative from Massachusetts, became the first member of Congress to announce his homosexuality. Barney Frank, another member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Massachusetts, also came out while serving in Congress in the 1980s. He was a powerful member of that body and within the Democratic Party into the 21st century. Tammy Baldwin, from Wisconsin, became the first openly gay politician to be elected to both the U.S. House, 1998, and the U.S. Senate, 2012. In 2009 Anise Parker was elected mayor of Houston, which made the fourth largest city in the U.S. the largest up to that time to elect an openly gay politician as mayor. Outside the United States, Openly gay politicians also scored successes. In Canada in 1998 Glenn Murray became the mayor of Winnipeg, Manitoba, which made him the first openly gay politician to lead a large city in that country. Large cities in Europe also were fertile grounds for success for openly gay politicians. For example, Bertrand Delanoy in Paris and Klaus Wowereit in Berlin were both elected mayor in 2001. At the local and national levels, the number of openly gay politicians increased dramatically during the 1990s and 2000s. And in 2009 Johanna Sigurdotter became Prime Minister of Iceland, which made her the world's first openly gay head of government. She was followed by Elio Di Rupo, who became Prime Minister of Belgium in 2011. In Africa, Asia, and Latin America, openly gay politicians have had only limited success in winning office. Notable elections to national legislatures included Patria Jimenez Flores in Mexico, 1997, Mike Waters in South Africa, 1999, and Claude Oval Hernans in Brazil, 2006. The issues emphasized by gay rights groups have varied since the 1970s by time and place. Different national organizations have promoted policies specifically tailored to their country's milieu. For example, whereas in some countries, particularly in Scandinavia, Sodomy statutes never existed or were struck down relatively early. In other countries the situation was more complex. In the United States, with its strong federal tradition, the battle for the repeal of sodomy laws initially was fought at the state level. In 1986 the U.S. Supreme Court upheld Georgia's sodomy law in Bowers v. Hardwick. Seventeen years later, however, in Lawrence v. Texas, the court reversed itself effectively overturning sodomy laws in Texas and 12 other states. Other issues of primary importance for the gay rights movement since the 1970s included combating the HIV-AIDS epidemic and promoting disease prevention and funding for research. Lobbying government for non-discriminatory policies in employment, housing, and other aspects of civil society. Ending the ban on military service for gay and lesbian individuals. Expanding hate crimes legislation to include protections for gays including transgender individuals, and securing marriage rights for same-sex couples, see same-sex marriage. In 2010 Democratic Pres. Barack Obama signed legislation that repealed the U.S. military's Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy, 1993-2011, which had permitted gay and lesbian individuals to serve in the military if they did not disclose their sexual orientation or engage in homosexual activity. The repeal effectively ended the ban on homosexuals in the military. In 2013 the Supreme Court recognized the right of same-sex couples to marry. Obergefell v. Hodges, 
and in 2020 the court determined that firing an employee for being homosexual or transgender was a violation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, 1964, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. Bostock v. Clayton County, Georgia. LGBT in Britain, Hate Crime and Discrimination Based on YouGov polling of more than 5,000 LGBT people in Britain, one in five LGBT people have experienced a hate crime or incident because of their sexual orientation and or gender identity in the last 12 months. Two in five trans people have experienced a hate crime or incident because of their gender identity in the last 12 months. Four in five anti-LGBT hate crimes and incidents go unreported, with younger LGBT people particularly reluctant to go to the police. LGBT in Britain. Hate crime and discrimination is Stonewall's new research highlighting the shocking levels of hate crime and discrimination that LGBT people still face in Britain today. Based on YouGov polling of over 5,000 LGBT people, the research reveals that anti-LGBT abuse extends far beyond acts of hate and violence on our streets. Many LGBT people still endure poor treatment while using public services and going about their lives, whether in their local shop, gym, school or place of worship. Download the report. Scotland and Cymru. Key findings. Hate crime. One in five LGBT people, 21%, have experienced a hate crime or incident due to their sexual orientation and or gender identity in the last 12 months. Two in five trans people, 41%, have experienced a hate crime or incident because of their gender identity in the last 12 months and one in six LGB people, who aren't trans, 16%, have experienced a hate crime or incident due to their sexual orientation in the same period. The number of lesbian, gay and bi people who have experienced a hate crime or incident in the last year because of their sexual orientation has risen by 78% from 9% in 2013 to 16% in 2017. Four in five LGBT people, 81%, who experienced a hate crime or incident didn't report it to the police. Three in ten LGBT people, 29%, avoid certain streets because they do not feel safe there as an LGBT person. More than a third of LGBT people, 36%, say they don't feel comfortable walking down the street while holding their partner's hand. This increases to 3 in 5 gay men, 58%. 1 in 10 LGBT people, 10%, have experienced homophobic, biphobic or transphobic abuse online directed towards them personally in the last month. This number increases to 1 in 4 for trans people, 26%, directly experiencing transphobic abuse online in the last month. Discrimination in daily life. 1 in 10 LGBT people, 10%, who were looking for a house or flat to rent or buy in the last year were discriminated against because of their sexual orientation and or gender identity. 1 in 6 LGBT people, 17%, who visited a cafe, restaurant, bar or nightclub in the last 12 months have been discriminated against based on their sexual orientation and or gender identity. One in four black, Asian and minority ethnic LGBT people, 24%, accessing social services in the last year have been discriminated against because of their sexual orientation and or gender identity. Almost three in 10 LGBT people, 28%, who visited a faith service or place of worship in the past 12 months experienced discrimination. 1 in 10 LGBT people, 10%, who attended a live sporting event in the last year experienced discrimination because of their sexual orientation and or gender identity. What respondents said. I had one incident where girls did not want to enter the bathroom stall I had used despite a large queue, like as if I was infected. Straight people don't know how privileged they are to not have their love questioned or to have romantic days out and not think about who is around you or how safe you are. Rachel, 22, London. I was assaulted by a man whilst I was holding hands with my lesbian partner. He grabbed me from behind and thrust himself into me, then verbally attacked me. Freya, 21, Wales. I had occasion to report that I had been harassed and suffered an injury. I talked, they listened but it was their attitude and I got the impression that it was not being taken seriously. 
what you can do. Stonewall has made the following recommendations for all individuals who want to help tackle anti-LGBT hate crime and discrimination. Take a visible stand against LGBT hate crime. Join Stonewall's Come Out for LGBT campaign and show your support for LGBT equality in all forms. Encourage your friends, family and colleagues to join the campaign. Call out online anti-LGBT abuse whenever you see it, so long as it is safe to do so. Support those being targeted by letting them know you are an ally. Let local business owners know if you witness an anti-LGBT incident from staff or other customers so that they can tackle it. Make clear that they could risk losing you and others as customers if they don't. Report incidents of homophobic, biphobic or transphobic discrimination you experience when accessing public services like housing or social services to the service provider or local council so they can take action. Contact Stonewall's Information Service on 08000 50 for advice and support. LGBTQ Rights Defend the rights of all people nationwide. Abortion care. Trans people's right to live freely. People's right to vote. Our freedoms are at stake and we need you with us. Donate today and fuel our fight in courts, state houses, and nationwide. The ACLU works to ensure that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer people can live openly without discrimination and enjoy equal rights, personal autonomy, and freedom of expression and association. What's at stake? The ACLU works to ensure that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people belong everywhere and can live openly and authentically without discrimination, harassment, or violence. The ACLU has a long history of defending the LGBTQ community. We brought our first LGBTQ rights case in 1936. What is now the John L. Stryker and Slobodan Randulovic LGBTQ and HIV project was founded in 1986 and renamed in 2021. Today, the ACLU brings more LGBTQ rights cases and advocacy initiatives than any other national organization does. In fact, the ACLU has been counsel in seven of the nine LGBTQ rights cases that the U.S. Supreme Court has decided, more than any other organization. With our reach into the courts and legislatures of every state, there is no other organization that can match our record of making progress both in the courts of law and in the court of public opinion. A Queer History of the United States for Young People Listed in School Library Journal's Best Nonfiction of 2019 Queer History Didn't Start with Stonewall This book explores how LGBTQ people have always been a part of our national identity contributing to the country and culture for over 400 years. It is crucial for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer youth to know their history. But this history is not easy to find since it's rarely taught in schools or commemorated in other ways. A Queer History of the United States for Young People corrects this and demonstrates that LGBTQ people have long been vital to shaping our understanding of what America is today. Through engrossing narratives, letters, drawings, poems, and more. The book encourages young readers, of all identities, to feel pride at the accomplishments of the LGBTQ people who came before them and to use history as a guide to the future. The stories he shares include those of asterisk indigenous tribes who embraced same-sex relationships and a multiplicity of gender identities. Asterisk Emily Dickinson, brilliant 19th century poet who wrote about her desire for women. Asterisk Gladys Bentley, Harlem blues singer who challenged restrictive cross-dressing laws in the 1920s. Asterisk Bayard Rustin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s close friend, civil rights organizer, and an openly gay man. Asterisk Sylvia Rivera, co-founder of STAR, the first transgender activist group in the U.S. in 1970. Asterisk Kiyoshi Karomiya, civil rights and anti-war activist who fought for people living with AIDS. Asterisk Jamie Nabosny, activist who took his LGBTQ school bullying case to the Supreme Court. Asterisk Aidan DiStefano, teen who brought a federal court case for trans-inclusive bathroom policies. Asterisk and many more. With over 60 illustrations and photos, a glossary, and a corresponding curriculum, 
A queer history of the United States for young people will be vital for teachers who want to introduce a new perspective to America's story. About the series. The Revisioning History for Young People series offers fresh perspectives on familiar narratives told from the viewpoint of marginalized communities with middle grade and young adults in mind. Consisting of accessibly written history books written by notable scholars and adapted by education experts, the series reconstructs and reinterprets America's past from pre-1492 to the present for a new generation of readers.